when I think about how the music played a role in my life when I was younger, a uh, great example would be brought to New York, 1947, maybe 48, almost 48, because it was like, I was three and a half thereabouts. And we moved to Brooklyn. For, uh, first it was Harlem, then we moved to Brooklyn. Uh, something more affordable for family, I guess. And I ended up in a, in a house, in an apartment building that still stands today, uh, on Chauncey Street, uh, between Lewis Avenue and Stuyvesant Avenue, in what we call Bed-Stuy, uh, Brooklyn. Okay, that was a, a community, couldn't have been more than five, maximum to 10 blocks in, of mostly uh, uh, Caribbean, black, uh, Latino, uh, Afro, African uh, people, generally speaking, in the Caribbean. So just that swath of land, all these people lived up and down. And there was a school in the, a small, elementary school, the public school 35. Um, another school uh, across the park, uh, 251 or something, but it was really small. But we also had the Amsterdam News, which was a spinoff of the, the Daily Mirror back in those days, or, or the, the Daily News, which might still exist today in New York City. But because it was Brooklyn and it was so big, the community was, was so dense and strong amongst themselves that community information was very, very important. So you could walk across the park to the newspaper building itself to get the newspaper to go. You had also in that area uh, Brooklyn College, which is a, or King's College, which is Brooklyn, um, King's County, not far away. You, we had so much that made up our community, that people in the community almost never had to go anywhere because they also had their own shops there, so you could buy whatever you wanted. So that said, there were people who made string instruments there. You know, they would find, God help the cat that was, was loose on the street. They would kill it, maybe, to get the cat gut to make the strings for their small instruments that they are used to playing. All this kind of, and dry it out and the whole thing, there. All right, all of this being that, that dense. Up at the end of Robert Fulton Park, which still exists, was a gazebo, huge build, building, pretty big, that covered most of the block. And inside this building, on, in the summer, as I remember it, <coughs> was from 8 o'clock to about 11 or 12 o'clock noon, musicians who came together, not just from our community, but from, uh, let's say, from Stuyvesant to Halsey or Reed, I can't remember the name of the other major street, one block over to our, say, less, the park is here, we go this way, and you're now moving into another community of Puerto Rican, Cuban, Venezuelan, uh, Colombian, Peru, and all these different people are living there. And they're, they're, you can tell the difference in the food. There was also a Catholic church there, where in our block there was Episcopal, Methodist, uh, Baptist, but no Catholic church. It was just the way it was made up. And so these people would come, and they would come to this gazebo, between 8 and 12, and share information with our, with our local musicians who played more dundun, played more, uh, they played more African kunga, uh, the long one, and the whole objective was to play together to mostly, mostly kind of lay, uh, uh, kind of makumba stuff and it was amazing what would happen. You could hear the, the speaking of the drums was either a dundun or a, or a quinto. They, uh, if you were from the southern part of South America, you were playing in tumbaos. 
which were the biggest of the congas, but in, in a place like Uruguay, they play tumbaos like they would play quintos. So you have three tumbaos of, of sizes that would be between four, uh, 16, in, in 15 inches uh, to, to 20 inch, huge. And these guys are playing like this. And then on top of that, very big sounding, other drums that would come in and they would play and they would communicate. And this happened every Saturday, rain or shine. So would you say that music was kind of, uh, uh, how do you say that, a lime stick or a, a lime? Uh, it was a lifeline. For the community, was it kind of an, an identity builder? Absolutely, and the music was a lifeline for the community, okay? And what happened is uh, people heard this and if it was like my house, which I'm sure it was in my household, my mom was dancing to this as she's cooking or she's singing certain lines that I couldn't tell because my, my family also was, uh, aside from, we're Nigerian, Nigerian based and s moving up over the generations, not too many. Um, my parents died, they were almost 100, okay. So they would go back, they remember. And then my grandmother was 100, and I can't remember what, but she played guitar uh, and uh, like uh, a tres and, and uh, something kind of like tres. But they sang in patois, uh, which is like French, Spanish, God knows what else in French, all that's inside. And they came up with this language so that, that is still spoken today around Santa Lucia places like this in the Caribbean. And, but it's all African based, West African based. And so the things that were being sung and played in that gazebo, I had no, only just felt it, okay? That had to be the base of everything I do today, you know, and, and it's why I, I think the way I think. Combined with radio stations and AM radio, where there was a, a radio station dedicated to Duke Ellington, a radio station dedicated to Ella Fitzgerald, a radio station dedicated to Frank Sinatra. You know, big band radio station. You could hear a sports teleclass of the New York football giants uh, uh, NFL team back then. And the, the theme song was, uh, Lalo Schifrin's new fantasy that was done on Verve. And this is da-da-da, ladies and gentlemen, now the football giants. I mean, it was all this kind of thing going on in New York City at the time. That was New York. That was Brooklyn. And then that, let's not even get into American baseball. And it's just so much going on. And you know, people never wanted to leave to go to Manhattan because it was too far away.